Hey, historians. Welcome to this evening's fireside chat on this Sunday evening. I'm so glad you're taking just a few moments out of your busy schedule, if it is busy, uh, to join me for this uh, brief discussion tonight. I hope you had a good holiday weekend and that you weren't overtaxed on Friday and that you had a chance to slow down a little bit, at least in your studies, and uh, spend time uh, with family, of course, the family that's in your home. Uh, regrettably, with our family that doesn't live in our home, we're only able to share times together through either FaceTime or Zoom meetings or even telephone calls. And I hope, I hope you did have a chance to do that. Um, we've got a pretty full week ahead of us. We had a full week last week, and we'll get to some of the housekeeping stuff here in just a, a few minutes, and uh, uh, we'll get to a little reading. Yes, I'm going to read to you this evening just a brief excerpt from another book that hopefully will serve as a bit of inspiration for us. And of course, what fireside chat would not be complete without uh, our warm tea this evening? Uh, tonight's uh, flavor choice is chai. It's got a little spice to it, uh, a little zing to it to add a little uh, bit of nourishment to our soul and our throat on this uh, rather uh, long week that we have ahead of us. A lot of talking for me, at least, in helping you get through period four. Mm. Chai. I was actually reading about uh, chai, and I was told that you can't call it chai tea. That's inaccurate. It's just chai. Um, so I will not inaccurately call it chai tea. I just have a warm cup of chai that is with me uh, this evening. But I think it's important in these days, which seem to get longer and longer and longer, almost like Groundhog Day. If you haven't seen the movie Groundhog Day, um, touch base with your parents. It's a famous movie from, I think, the early 90s by Bill Murray, in which he gets up each day. Perhaps you have seen it in which he repeats his day over and over and over again. It does kind of feel like that. So it is important to keep up with those routines, uh, get a little bit of outdoor activity in. I know I'm uh, uh, getting those outdoor walks in and still visiting with the ducks. Um, I need to do some more sidewalk chats to get those posted. And much to your either excitement or your cringiness, I am uh, learning how to TikTok. So I'm the first TikTok I'm doing is going to be from period two in which Roger Williams and Hutchinson get banned from John Winthrop's Massachusetts Bay Colony. So we'll see how that turns out. But I do want to just pause for just a moment and uh, at least during this holiday season and tell you what I'm thankful for. And uh, I'm thankful for, of course, my continued health. I hope that you're also thankful for your continued health, that you and your family are very healthy. Can Very thankful for a full pantry. Um, again, as I've often joked, that there is uh, no curves being flattened in this house <laughs> and that I am uh, <laughs> countering the, uh, the continued uh, ingestion of calories by countering that with some walking. So I can hopefully flatten that curve in the uh, days ahead. But I am thankful for uh, the roof over my head and for continued electricity and, of course, a job. And I know that uh, there are many amidst uh, our community and in the greater uh, global community that are not of good health and that are uh, not gainfully employed and uh, don't have a, a stable future. And so I ask us to do pause and just kind of reflect on those individuals and be thankful for what we do have and the privileges that we do have amidst this global uh, pandemic. So one thing I'm looking forward to this week is getting into period four. Um, at this point in the course, we should have period seven way behind us. You should have all the AP classrooms in. I'm still waiting on a few of you to get the AP classroom in for period seven. I'm trying to be as flexible as I possibly can, but some of you guys are starting to test that flexibility a little bit. Um, and I don't know if it's necessarily an issue of you not having connection to the internet um, or if it's just, I'm going to be direct laziness on your part. So um, yeah, I can give you a few days on some stuff. I can work with you even at the end of the week. But when we start pushing two weeks on this kind of stuff, then that really is drawing into question the kind of energy that you're putting towards this course. So period seven should be a done deal. Um, very directly, if it doesn't get done by the end of this week, I am going to have to go with some zeros in the grade book. So please get period seven's SAQ done and period seven's uh, MCQs done in the AP classroom. 
as far as period three goes last week, we had the MCQs for period three. You're still working through those. I hope you're going to get those done by tonight. But if you need a little extra time, a little extra time, I will afford you that so you can have that kind of flexibility. But really, an entire week to do, what, 33 multiple choice questions, it's not that taxing. So uh, please don't take advantage of that in a negative way. Take advantage of it in a good way, but not in a negative way. And then your modified DBQ for period three should be in the final stages of working through it. For those of you that joined me in Zoom last week, uh, we did talk about the period three modified DBQ. And I said that your context and thesis needs to be full paragraphs, full formal writing, but that when you get into the doc analysis, generating an argument through four documents um, that uh, your MS that you're going to be conducting, uh, you could do so by bullet pointed, and I don't mind according to document one. Uh, we're just doing straight uh, laboratory clinical type writing at this point, nothing formal. So again, context and thesis, full paragraphs, um, your um, analysis of the documents, four out of the five documents, analyze the MS, providing an argument, remember a counter argument to that. Um, yes, COVID-19 is awful, but I'm saving money on dry cleaning, right? That counter argument can be bullet pointed. Your outside evidence, two pieces of outside evidence can also be bullet pointed. And so can your analysis and reasoning, your HAPs. So you could have historical context and then have uh, a sentence about that historical context purpose. And you could even say the purpose of document four is to convince Americans that dot, 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 right? So, uh, and then the complexity is more of a first person complexity. What is it that uh, I, I see complexity being? And then you can give me X, Y, Z of what complexity is. So that'll be much more clinical, like I said, formulaic, very, very bullet pointed, uh, with the exception of context and thesis, makes it easier for me to grade and to provide feedback. I'm going to go through now this week, uh, particularly on Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday when we're not meeting on Zoom, uh, to give you that constructive feedback to make sure you're writing those DBQs with the kind of uh, attention to detail that you need to in preparation for the uh, national exam. Later on in the course, we get to about period five, period six, then we'll be doing some timed 45 minute uh, DBQs. But if it takes you uh, two minutes to do it, I know you wrote it in a previous document, copied, pasted, that's fine. It's not gonna trigger uh, the turnitin.com uh, analysis or return rate on that. Um, and if it took you 17 hours, that's fine. That means you just started it and came back and worked on it a little bit later. But hopefully I will see 100% return on those, meaning 100% of you guys did turn those in, both period three um, for your uh, MCQs and your DBQs. Now for period four, which will be starting uh, tomorrow, we'll have our standard Zoom meetings. We'll do period four, part one walk you through kind of a chronological review, looking at the overall political, economic, and social fabric of uh, Jeffersonian democracy. Um, we'll look at territorial expansion under Madison and Monroe. And then we'll, of course, move into Jacksonian democracy uh, in Wednesday of next week. But that's content. And we'll talk about content when we have class. This is Fireside Chat and just a time for us to gather. And regroup on a Sunday night and know what tasks that we have ahead and to ensure that you are doing well and that you are staying on top of uh, your business. Now, what I'd like to do, oh, that chai is good, is take a brief moment and reflect on a, uh, well, I've made no secrets about this, my favorite uh, president, Franklin Delano uh, Roosevelt. Um, he's called a traitor to his class. H.W. Uh, Brands, the author here, H.W. Brands, is a famous history professor at the University of Texas at Austin. Perhaps if you've seen any kind of clip on the History Channel, you've seen Dr. Brands uh, uh, on many of those different clips. A renowned author, uh, wrote uh, Jackson's biography and numerous others, but uh, one of the, the greatest biographies written on FDR was The Privileged Life and the Radical Presidency of Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, by Dr. Brands. And I want to begin uh, with this. And, and I think it's important because of uh, the date, and you'll see why. In the quiet beauty of the Georgia spring, like a thief in the night, FDR's doctor wrote, I had seen it coming for quite some time, but I never thought it would be so quick. Roosevelt was awoken just after 9 a.m. He descended downstairs with the help of his nurse and his maid and began going through mail. It was time for lunch a few hours later in which he held his hand up and says, no, Mr. Pettyman, 
I'm assuming that's one of the cooks in the house. We have 15 more minutes of work to do. As Roosevelt began to shuffle through some more mail, he suddenly had a strange expression come over his face. After he coughed twice, his head tilted toward the table, his hands began fumbling among the letters. Daisy, and Daisy is his um, per personal caretaker, like a nurse, if you will. Daisy thought he was trying to find something, and she approached the table and said, Mr. President, are you looking for something? And at which point he looked up, gasped, and his forehead hit the table. He had lost consciousness. Daisy had motioned to immediately call the doctor. And within just 15 minutes, the doctor arrived and found pale, Roosevelt pale, unconscious and cold, profusely sweating, laying on the couch. His heart rate was 96 beats per minute. With the help of additional people from the manor, the doctor moved FDR upstairs to the bed. And at 3.30 p.m., the doctor noted that Roosevelt's breathing was irregular and not very strong. He attempted artificial respiration without effect. He injected Roosevelt with caffeine sodium benzoate in the skeletal muscle and then adrenaline directly into the heart muscle. Neither of these actions restored Roosevelt. And at 3.35 p.m., the doctor had pronounced Franklin Delano Roosevelt dead. That was today, April 19th. And so, excuse me, April 12th. Uh, and so it's important uh, that the funeral is the 19th. That's why I said the 19th. But today, April 12th, at the recording of this fireside chat, is when Roosevelt had finally succumbed to his illnesses. I think what's so extraordinary, and the reason why I want to talk about Roosevelt for just a second, is the leadership of Roosevelt has been, in essence, the model, the guide for kind of moving us through these fireside chats and through our time together during our own, and I don't want to say it's a great depression. I think that, yes, these are trying times amidst this COVID-19 outbreak, but uh, I think they do pale in comparison, at least at this point for what we saw occurring during both of the world wars and certainly during the Great Depression. But we can draw a lot of parallels between those events and what is being called of us to continue to practice social distancing and to practice uh, self-quarantining and, and doing our part to kind of mitigate, flatten the curve, if you will, of the expansion of this disease. And I think as, and, and this is why I said earlier, April 19th, and it was the beginning of his funeral. And here's what Dr. Brand says uh, on April 19th, just a few days from now. Across Georgia, the Carolinas and Virginia, mourners lined the route. Men and women, grandparents, toddlers, whites, blacks. They waited in the daylight and in the dark of night to pay their respects to the only president that this entire generation had known a president who made them all feel that the government of their country cared for them. He had given them reassurance during the most frightening phase of the Great Depressions, during the New Deal, and confidence during the most trying days of the Second World War. This had been a remarkable accomplishment for when America found its darkest days to be their absolute darkest, it was Roosevelt that put faith into them. He believed in them. He believed in the capacity of ordinary, everyday Americans, doctors and nurses, teachers and clergy, exercising their collective judgment to address the ills of the afflictions of society. He refused to rely on the invisible hand of the marketplace for the compelling reason that during his lifetime, the invisible hand had wrecked very visible havoc on millions of unoffending Americans. But he refused to accept that government invariably bungled whatever it attempted. And his refusal inspired government efforts that had a tremendous positive effect on millions of the marginals, the marginal farmers, the marginal furloughed workers, the struggling merchants, the very people who now lined the train route watching him head back home north. 
And did he get everything right? By no means he did not. He never claimed that he did. Roosevelt would be the first to tell you that he didn't get much right. But he did get a great deal right. He caught the banking system in the free fall and guided it to a soft landing. He sponsored rules that helped prevent a recurrence of the banking collapse and of the stock market crash that preceded it. But beyond all of that, including the days that followed the attack on Pearl Harbor, he gave America hope. He didn't end the Great Depression. He didn't even end World War II. But he did banish the despair that the Depression had engendered. He banished the fear that the Second World War had wrought. And he understood intuitively, perhaps it was Woodrow Wilson and his moral diplomacy, that the presidency above all was a moral office. And the president who speaks to the hopes and dreams of the people can speak to a nation. Roosevelt did speak to the hopes and dreams of a nation, and together they changed America into one of the greatest generations this country has ever known. Roosevelt, on this day, April 12th, lost his life quietly at a home in Georgia right before lunch. What is so poignant about this is that the president, while he'll even say his policies did provide some um, impact on the ills of the economy or the dangers of war, it would be that spirit of hope, that tuning into the American spirit. And like I've said time and time again, when we analyzed Roosevelt two weeks ago and we looked at the greatest generation last week and we look at Roosevelt appropriately again, that in these trying times like the pandemic that we are experiencing, the history that we are living through, what is being called upon you, particularly as a high schooler, is that you are not to give up hope. And so I think if we had Roosevelt still with us today, or if we were to channel the spirit of Roosevelt, and we're trying to do so through these fireside chats, he would continue to encourage us to meet like this on Sunday nights, to uh, communicate together, and to not give up hope, to continue to stay strong, and uh, do his bit. Okay, okay, real quick, one more little tiny thing, and I'll be done. There's one little last passage on here that I love. Um, he loved uh, Winston Churchill. And Churchill absolutely adored um, the president. Okay, so here's the last part, Brands. I, I love how Brands finished the book on this. And this kind of tells you the kind of caliber that FDR is, and then I'll let you go. Okay, so Winston Churchill and FDR had just finished their conference in Casablanca, and they were celebrating the, the terms at which they finally brought the war uh, to an end. Now, Winston Churchill was very frustrated because he could not attend the funeral of FDR. Um, he was a great admirer of FDR and would have wanted to be there uh, most certainly, but the demands of uh, the war, because remember the war is still going on. FDR didn't see an end to the Second World War just yet, uh, but the war prevented him from you know, journeying to America for the funeral. Um, so, but the prime minister, it says here, and this is Brand's words, the prime minister had been bracing himself emotionally for the loss of his partner. And at the close of the Casablanca conference, Roosevelt was ready to leave. Churchill stopped him and said, my good friend, you cannot go all this way to North Africa without seeing Marrakech. Let us go spend two days there by ourselves. I must be with you when you see the sunset on the snows of the Atlas Mountains. So Roosevelt agreed, put off his departure, and he and Churchill drove the 150 miles from Casablanca to Marrakech across the desert. Would you have loved to have been in that car ride? They spoke of the war and of politics and of history and of philosophy and of the region of North Africa and the future of the world. Marrakech was everything Churchill had promised. Its lush gardens afforded a respite from the desert. Its ancient sooks a reminder that life continued amid the war. An American living in the city loaned her villa to the eminent tourists who arrived just as the sun was setting. The villa had a tower with a view of the mountains and of the city, and Churchill climbed the 60 steps. Roosevelt 
was carried up by two strong young men at the manor. The two watched the sun go down and saw the dimming light paint the snowy peaks with shifting pastels. Churchill smoked a cigar. Roosevelt smoked a cigarette. It's the most lovely spot in the whole world, said the prime minister. And now the city had begun to glow and the lamps of the mosque towers came on. Roosevelt and Churchill sat there together, celebrating the successes that their countries had shared and the greater victories that were to come. They drank and sang songs together as night fell. The next morning, Roosevelt awoke and boarded his plane. Churchill refused to let the president drive to the airfield that accompanied, so he put on his slippers and his robe with cigar in hand, and the two rode in the car together to the airfield. They shook hands a final time on the tarmac, and Roosevelt walked up the plane with much help by the two aides. As the door of the aircraft closed, Churchill turned to the vice consul, Kenneth Pendar, and said, Come, Pendar, let's go home. I don't like to see the airplanes take off. The car carrying the prime minister and the U.S. diplomat began to pull away, and Pendar watched through the rear window as the president's plane gained speed and lifted off into the clouds. Churchill said, don't tell me when they take off. It makes me far too nervous. If anything happens to that man, I shan't stand it. He is the truest friend. He is the greatest man I have ever known. That's how he ends the book. FDR, okay. Enough nerding out on FDR tonight. But that gives me inspiration. Like times like this, like the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, I look to history for these times and I look to leaders and, and profiles and courage. Ooh, I might even, well, let's read from Profiles and Courage next week from John F. Kennedy. That'll be good. So uh, that's our task at hand. So like Roosevelt, he would tell us, don't give up, keep staying strong. Um, what will history say about you? What will history write about you? Um, what will you do to really take the mantle of this great moment in our global history during this pandemic uh, to show uh, your great discipline um, during this time period? And that means not giving up on classes. That means turning into your assignments. That means staying on top of your writing and getting prepared for the exam and doing all of the trappings that you should as a high school student in preparation for not only just your AP exams, but certainly uh, for the future. This is a great test, not bubbling in A, B, or C, not writing a formal essay. This time is a great test. And so I hope you're not going to fold your arms and fold up and say, all right, this sucks. This is terrible. I'm done. Franklin Roosevelt wouldn't do it, and I know you're not going to do it, too. All right, that concludes our fireside chat tonight. A little long, but uh, certainly important. Inspiration. I care about you. I'm still committed to this 100%. Uh, I hope you're committed to this 100%, and we will uh, get started on period four. So it's all next week. Period four is next week, and the following week's period five, and then period six. So we're now in a pattern, baby. We're, we're right in line with this. So I hope to see you again 10, 12, 2, 4, and 6 tomorrow. Uh, I do this show five times a day. And then I record a special broadcast for individuals that don't get a chance to be there for the Zoom. But I do hope to see you there. And one little quick housekeeping note on Zoom before I let you go. Um, please do your best to turn your camera on. Um, like I, most of y'all had your camera on. And it's two things. I know you're engaged because I'm spending a lot of time preparing these lessons and these slideshows for you. So I want to see that you're engaged uh, on, on the screen. And two, it's a conversation. It's like being in class. I want to physically see so we can have virtual eye contact and be able to connect uh, that way. And I had one, I think the 12 o'clock uh, session last Wednesday, it was like all boxes of names. And I was just talking like in a pitch black room of just names. And that was a little unsettling. So do your best um, to, uh, you know, throw a ball cap on. If you don't look your very best, it's not, I don't care about that. I just want to be able to, that's what's so important about these Zoom meetings is I want to connect with you. If they weren't, I would just record a YouTube and let you watch it on your own. So uh, do your best to turn your cameras on and be plugged in and ready to go uh, for our, our Zoom time uh, together. All right, that's it for me. Enough talking. Be well, be wise. Thank you for joining me this evening. And uh, hey, let's get started on period four uh, tomorrow. Dissociate.